Welcome back to my Commodore 64 memories videos. This is where I look at old Commodore 64 software and some of the technical details behind them. Today we have Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe, released in 1991, published by Imageworks. Coder was Carl Muller, graphics Alan Tompkins, musician Martin Walker, and the box art was Glenn Fabry. We're going to be looking at the disc version today and I always thought that this was doing some kind of like loading but it's not it's doing several passes of decompression but then we get into this lovely intro sequence it's very nicely animated I think it sets the tone of the game really well the graphics are great so we have these sprites up at the top with the speedball logo Interesting to note, actually, that the double E and the double L are actually horizontally expanded sprites. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sprites up at the top there just for the logo. Ah, and then we get this rather nice animated spinny sprite 2 in the middle of the screen. But we can see from the horizontal bounding boxes there that we've got those horizontally expanded sprites for the E's and the L's. Makes sense right uh, there are no smooth smooth curves or anything like that not like for the B or the D so they can afford to horizontally expand those sprites looking at the full screen there we've got bitmap mode there and we've got the logo but we can see there increasing and decreasing memory reads so that's probably copying across a whole bunch of sprite frames into the displayed sprite bank because the screen is using a bitmap mode, and so when you're using bitmap mode, practically just over half of the bit bank, if you've got a full screen bitmap, is being used just for the bitmap data and its associated color information. So you're going to want to copy in dynamically those sprites to, to update the spinning two logo. If we look at that space in memory, we can see what looks like fragments of sprite data as well. So I'm not too surprised about that. But yeah, this is a fantastic introduction to the game. The music works really well. Uh, the scrolling message down at the bottom of the screen is, of course, text rather than bitmap. After another load, we get into this real part of the game, the, the second part. There's quite a lot of decompression. Okay, so we've got this screen at the beginning. Again, looks quite nice. But I don't think we ever see this screen again. So I think it's probably shown once and then decompressed over. It's a nice little bitmap screen. Uh, the bitmap resides at E000, so that's way up at the end of the last bit bank. Uh, we have this one player, two player and demo mode choice. I'm going to choose the demo mode because it's actually fantastically self-playing. So we can just let the computer play the game and then we can study the game as things are scrolling around. Interesting thing about this game is that it's actually got quite a large number of sprites flying around occasionally because, you know, there's several players on each team and if you have most of the players on the pitch in the game area at the same time, then you're going to have quite a lot of sprites. So we can immediately see that there are two buffers being used for the screens. If I put the targeting cursor in the middle of the screen there, we can see it's alternating between what looks like what's it, CC00 and F400. Uh, we have two character sets, one at F000 and F800 for the game. Well, for the score panel at the bottom is F000 and for the game is F800. So two character sets in the same big bank. Let's see if I can pause that when all of those players are on the screen. Nope, that was far too late. Uh, the thing is about this version of C64 Debug GUI is that uh, sometimes clicking the buttons for like pause and unpause, uh, there's usually like a second or a second and a half or two seconds worth of lag. 
before the pause actually takes effect, which is a little bit annoying. Let's see if I can time that a bit better. And pause. Okay. There we go. Okay, so the screen's faded out, but the sprites, the sprite formation is still active on the screen. So let's go into the Vic debugger and then let's see what we can find out about this multiplexer. Let's move the targeting cursor down the screen and we'll see when it starts updating sprites. So it's, it's here that the sprite registers seem to have been uh, reset so that all of the sprites are down at the bottom of the screen. And then just at this point here, the first sprite, the topmost sprite, actually for the player formation at the beginning of the game, has just been updated. Let's move the targeting cursor back through the time of the screen uh, raster line schedule. And we can see there it's starting to update CFF8. So that's uh, going to be the sprite pointers, I expect, on the screen that's visible. Yes. And then it's updating the VIC registers for the sprite positions. And But it's just updated one sprite. That's odd, but okay. The next raster is scheduled to occur at raster line 34. We're currently at raster line 32, so we'll scroll ahead a little bit more. Uh, it's a bad line state, so the CPU is not going to become active until right at the end, almost, of the raster line. Don't forget that the VIC chip steals bad lines from the CPU and stuns the CPU execution as it's fetching extra character information every eight character every eight pixels for each character row in a standard screen of course this can be varied by altering this vertical y scroll register anyway uh, the sprite registers are being updated for their position and also their pointers so the frame pointer don't forget the screen is all black uh, because that's just when I could pause the game. But we seem to have, if I move the targeting cursor up and down here, you can see that the next sprite is being updated. It looks like just before it's needed. Maybe eight or nine raster lines before the sprite is needed. Let's go down. Yeah, look, just here. So the, the multiplexer is not updating just underneath the bottom of the sprite as it's finished rendering. It's actually updating the sprite, kind of like eight or nine raster lines just before it's actually needed on the screen for rendering. So it's a, a just-in-time multiplexer rather than a, a more efficient um, just-after update. And I go into this in a lot more detail on my videos about sprite multiplexers and how to write a sprite multiplexer. I'll try and remember to add that to the video description below. So here we go. At this point in the game here, we've got a nice bitmap screen being used with a couple of sprites overlaid for the uh, flashing arrow effects. Look. But this is has surprised me in this game is that the game makes quite heavy use of uh, bitmap screens to display all of the uh, graphical user interface, which is great because it means that you get very colorful screens, but it does mean that at some point, the game needs to account for quite heavy usage in one of the VIC banks for having eight kilobytes being, or eight kilobytes plus a bit more actually for each bitmap screen. So the bitmap screens are going to be decompressed, of course. And the the memory used doesn't have to be permanently allocated for bitmaps. Of course, you can put sprites in there when you're displaying text mode, for example, and things like that. Um, or you can change your memory allocation patterns to include code, sprites, whatever. But yeah, it does mean that this game has to keep on swapping in and out quite large amounts of data. You can see here that there's a little sprite or a couple of sprites, uh, expanded sprites being used for a highlighting box around uh, the heads on this bitmap screen here. So you can configure your team members, right? Let's 
Oh, there's some sprites on the left-hand side as well for the status panel or something like that, maybe. Oh, there's a whole bunch of sprites down the middle. Did you notice that? It seemed to take quite a while to render that human uh, human uh, shaped graphic as well, right? There we go. Look, it took several frames. So it's basically compositing into the bitmap. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, this game does spend quite a lot of time decompressing, but it's got quite a lot of dynamic decompression going on for the graphical user interface screens the player with their armor or, or you know their whatever the terminology is that they use in this port for the stuff that they have to wear right the shoulder pads and the chest pads and well actually it looks like they're kitted out in full riot gear right not a surprise because that's the violent nature of this you know supposedly futuristic speedball game But yeah, I do really like the way that this game uses a, a lunch and a bitmap screens with quite a lot of decompression and bitmap plus uh, sprite overlay animations. So we've got some sprite overlays there for the for the buttons. I'm guessing aggression, attack, defend, speed, uh, throw, power, stamina, and intelligence. I guess so. It all adds uh, an extra layer of uh, color and complexity to those screens. I mean, bitmap screens are great in terms of color complexity on their own, but adding sprite overlays over the top um, allows you to have, if you want, nice high resolution sprites to, to give you readable text over the top of multicolored bitmap screens. It's a good technique to use. So we can see here, wow, look, if I go into ICU 64 now, uh, we can see that there's a ton of decompression going on. Wow, several passes through the memory. Oh, look, there we go. There's the Animating 2 logo. Uh, back into the introduction now. So in ICU 64, we can clearly see in the debug graphics map there, all of those sprite frames that need to get copied into the other Vic Bank for displaying the sprites over the top of the bitmap data. So if we have a look now, into the last bit bank now for the sprite data sheet. Uh, we will be able to see, if we go back, there we go, dynamically animated sprites, so basically copying those sprites. There's two copies of it, and that's because effectively the sprite data is double buffered, so as it's displaying one on the screen, it's copying across the data for the other one. Uh, that's fair enough. Let's just quickly see using a range breakpoint if there's any drive code running. There isn't any drive code running. That's intriguing, right? So there's the Vic bank viewed as a bitmap screen. We can see that the bitmap data takes up the latter half of the Vic bank. And then before it, we've got a whole bunch of sprite data plus a couple of screens for the color information. Well, one screen for the color information and then the other color RAM for the color information, right? But uh, we have uh, some sprite frames up at the top. Okay, so notice there up at the top of the sprite graphics map view that actually the animated middle of the, you know, the, the thing which ejects the ball are animated, uh, well, are basically sprite frames, but then they get replaced with all of the pickup animations and, well, it's basically the ball and pickup animations, right? And the spinning coins and the shields and whatever armor pieces and energy drinks or whatever it is. But yeah, look, they get copied over. Well, that's quite a lot of um, sprite frames actually that get copied over. So there's quite a lot of updating of dynamic sprite information between the various different parts of this game. And of course the bitmap data as well is being uh, decompressed or copied into the last fit bank for displaying. So we can see there, because I've got that watch store point at C000, then we can see all of the different usages of the, the data as it's being copied over or decompressed over. 
at the beginning of that last Vic bank there. So we can see all of the player sprites are now in memory. And some of the player sprites uh, for the diving animations and stuff like that, we can see that there's actually some sprites that have uh, overwritten what was there previously. So the bitmap data that was there previously. But yeah, so we've got the... Well, okay, so yeah, definitely there's data being copied into the C00 there. If I filled that data and then ran the code, it was copying over it. Yeah, okay. So let's see what we can find out. These sprite frames for the ball injector are currently in memory. If I fill over them with AA, there we go, and then allow the next decompression to happen, actually it's not quite deep. Well, it is decompression, but it's using what looks like delta decompression because the previous data is sometimes partially used, look, for the next bunch of sprite frames as they're decompressed. So delta decompression is where previously existing data is partially used during decompression of the new data. So it's basically copying previous or pre-existing blocks of memory in different places. And it's a bit more efficient to do that because uh, new data doesn't have to be introduced in the in the compressed data stream, previous data can be copied and reused, which is potentially more efficient. It's actually quite unusual to find uh, such a delta decompression technique being used in a game. So yes, if you like these kind of technical deep dive videos, then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel or sending me a super thanks. They are always very much appreciated. Take care, have a great day, evening or night, wherever you are.